Samaritan woman, a day would come when they would neither worship in Jerusalem or on, nor on Mount Gezerim. Because over at Mount Gezerim, they worship God in ignorance. In Jerusalem, they worshiped God with just knowledge, and that also was wrong. For truth without excitement is also wrong. Some folk know the truth, but they can't get excited about pure gospel. Still others, all they have is excitement. So we talked about the danger of enthusiastic heresy, which is a shallow and a self-styled type of worship. And since I couldn't find a way to fit the definition of what worship really would be, I called it ecclesiastical rhizology. There are a lot of folk in religion today who have heat but no light. There are others who have light but no heat. Some wish to be in the kind of church that's going to challenge their minds. And we discovered there is nothing wrong with that. However, you can serve God. You cannot serve God with just your mind. I'm going to say it again. You cannot just serve God with your mind. For God created you to worship and adore him. Hello, somebody. Even God's throne is made up of noise <laughs> as it turns around to see what's going on in the universe. It's a wheel way up in the middle of the air. Big wheel runs by, and a little wheel runs by the, talk to me, a wheel and a wheel way up in the, one wheel constantly says, Hallelujah. Can y'all picture that? All this noise going on. Glory, hallelujah, while you trying to get your prayers through. You, you, you know sometimes when you're in your own room or in your own house, you say, sweetheart, would you please calm down? Or don't talk so loud. I'm trying to hear something on the TV. Or I'm trying to listen to something on, on, the, on the telephone. And all this noise is going on constantly in the throne room of God. And God hears just what your issue, issue is all about, too. Then there's the church, which always has a shouting good time. There's nothing wrong with going up the wall and shouting. But when you come down from the wall, be able to tell us why you went up the wall. Nothing wrong with shouting and running. But be able to tell us why you ran and shouted. Are you there? The text says there's something wrong with a religion that only challenges the mind and never warms the heart. <laughs> because truth does not warm the heart, it only challenges and informs the mind. Woo. I just said a word. Look, look at your neighbor and say, however. It is the Spirit of God that warms the heart. Is that right? And yet, neither one are acceptable to God. God is not looking for that hot box church where you are running all over the church, falling backwards and foaming at the mouth. He, 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 he's not looking for that kind of church. Neither is he looking for a church with dead orthodoxy with no praise in it. To have true worship, spirit, and truth must have a wedding. I'm going to say it again. Spirit and truth must have a wedding. There must be a union coming together when spirit and truth becomes one. That's when we develop an intimate relationship with God which causes us to discover the real truth about ourselves, uh, which brings out the real worship in me. 
I, I, am I too heavy this morning? I, you you, you got to understand what I, what I just said. In order for me to have true worship, I must develop an intimate relationship with God so that I learn how to acknowledge who he is, what he did, and how I find myself wrapped up inside of him so that I can praise him. Which means there are three pictures of worship. How many pictures? Three pictures of worship. And when you get home, you can find them, and they're all wrapped up in John 12, 1 through 7. We have three pictures. In the first place, you can worship God in spirit and in truth. What did I say? You can worship God in spirit and in truth. Secondly, you can worship the wrong God. I'm going to say that again. Secondly, you can worship the wrong God. And thirdly, you can worship God in vain. Listen, this, this is deep. If worshiping the wrong God is the problem of the world, then worshiping God in vain is the problem of the church. Do, do, do I need to say it again? If worshiping the wrong God is the problem of the world, then worshiping God in vain is the problem of the church. What, what, what is worshiping God in vain then? I'm glad you asked. Worshiping the right God, but worshiping God the wrong way. God gets upset if you worship something other than him, but he also gets upset when you worship him your way rather than his prescribed way as he has outlined in his word. Now listen at this. Listen at this. Please get this good. Too many times the church has been worshiping the principle over and beyond God. I, I wish I wish I can, can I I say it too many times the church has been guilty of worshiping the principle over and beyond God. In other words, catch this. I messed up. Yes, 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 I, I messed up. I have to bear the consequences of my choices. But somehow or another, the church has forgotten the words called mercy and grace. Somehow the church is more concerned about what we wear. than how we're converted inside of our hearts. The church is too busy looking on the outside while God is looking on the inside. That's why there are going to be some folk who you think would not go to heaven but be with in heaven and others won't even be there. I, I'm... I'm we place the letter of the law above and beyond the person. What if God placed the law above and beyond the person? Nobody would live. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. If my people who are called by my name should seek my face, humble themselves, I will heal their land and I will heal from heaven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And here we are. We cannot forgive each other. So then, 
we have what I call rhizology. We, 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 we have dogma. Instead of Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. And when I start loving you, I can keep the Sabbath. I can look at another woman but don't want her because I have my own. Because I'm wrapped up, uh, tied up uh, inside. I wish y'all would talk with me. I'm wrapped up and tied up inside of God. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I think I'm preaching this morning. I think I'm preaching. God. Oh, this thing. <laughs> God is not interested in our self-style worship. He says, worship me as I have outlined for you to worship me. Is it all right if I travel to that text? Huh? Because, because we look at that text and we do not really look at it in the form of having worship and taking a risk when I worship. Here's Jesus at the home of Simon the leper. And they were throwing a thank you banquet <laughs> because Jesus had recently raised Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus also recently healed Simon of leprosy. So you have a resurrected man who was dead physically, and the other man was dead spiritually and socially. Which one are you? Whew. Both of them are now alive. And they're having a party. I, I, I wish I had time, but I don't have time to talk about the fact that worship ought to be a party. Come on, fess up. You used to worship, didn't you? When you were in the world, you, should, you, you shouldn't stop partying because you were saved now. You ought to start partying every time you think about the goodness of God. You, you, you ought to start partying every time you think about what God brought you out of. You ought to just change the focus of the party. But, but I, I, don't, I don't have time to talk about that. I got to move on. There, there's Mary who came from Bethany. You, don't, you do know who Mary was, don't you? Some say she was that beloved prostitute. When she entered Simon's home, she entered the room and she, look at the text, she carried an alabaster box. I wish Kim had that song to sing after, but I forgot to call her. But if she got it, I wanted to sing it after. And, 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 and it, had, it, it had some obsession mixed with passion in it. And, and, and she broke open the bottle and lavishly, the, the text said, lavishly and poured this perfume on Jesus' feet. Now, now some of the disciples, especially Judas, became indignant because he calculated mentally the amount of money this perfume cost. Now watch this. These so-called Christians have a conservative style of smile in your face, but stab you in your back. They wish to appear right in their frame of worship. They did not want anyone to look at them cross-eyed, so they stayed normal. Look at your neighbor and say normal. <laughs> Which tells me true worship involves a degree of risk. Can you say this with me? True worship involves a degree of what? Listen, our generation doesn't take many risks. We are less inclined to take risk. That's why a lot of us get married so late. 
we want to try it out first. This generation does a lot of looking, but little leaping. Because they are slow about risk. But you need to understand that Jesus, who called the disciples to drop their nets and follow him, he is the great caller of risk takers. He calls you to take risks. They had to drop their nets and follow him. He calls us to drop whatever net it is that's standing between us and him. Let me ask you, what net are you holding that you need to let go in order to follow Christ? Is it the nets of meitis? Is it the net of self-sufficiency? What about the net of backbiting? What about the net of pride? Or oh, if I had time, nets of so-called sanctified righteousness. In order to worship God, there are times when one must take a risk to obtain true worship. Now notice the text. It says it was costly perfume. I know it was costly because it had such a terrific smell and it came from the root of an exotic plant that was only found and is still only found today in the Himalayan mountains they had to manufacture it right there on the spot they could not just take it from the tree and take it someplace else. They had to manufacture this perfume from the local spot. Are y'all in here? And then ship it all over the world. And you could only open it once or twice. That's how expensive it was. Notice the Bible says she opened the bottle and poured it all over the master's feet to show how much she loved him. And Judah said, what a waste. She could, she could have given that money to the church. It could have paid a year's salary for one missionary or for one of the disciples. He said it was costly. Now, if you look at those texts, in the context of worship, it simply tells you that worship is not free. Can I say that again? If you look at the context of the text expository, you will discover worship will cost you something. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to say it again. Worship will cost you something. Acts the three Hebrew believers. They were told to bow down. They stood up. They were thrown in the fiery furnace. Acts Daniel. Acts Mordecai. Acts Job. Then why in the world are you so puzzled that you can't get your praise on when you come to church sometimes? It takes a risk. Listen, listen, in order to give true biblical worship to God, there are two areas of risk. How many areas? Visibility and vulnerability. <laughs> Can I? Visibility and vulnerability. In order to give true biblical worship to God, one must take a risk. Now notice this, this woman was risking her image. She risked her resources, and now she's risking her new reputation. Because before, she was an ex-prostitute. So because she was an ex-prostitute, she had started a new way of style. So now all of a sudden you mean to tell me you're going to change me back to prostitution? Oh, y'all not up in here. 
change me back to prostitution. This woman had been cleansed. Demons had been taken out of her by Jesus. When Mary broke the bottle of perfume, the perfume and the aroma goes all over the house. Don't you know it raised some eyebrows? <laughs> Not, but, 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 but get this, get the picture. Not only does she pour the perfume on Jesus' feet, but now she takes her hair down. Now, wait, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to picture this thing. I, you, you, uh, can y'all, you, you know, you know the, one, of the most, one of the most attractive, attractive things that a woman has is a hair when she takes her hair down. Oh, y'all, y'all not up in here. When, when she takes her hair down, she's ready for business. Oh, y'all not up in the house. Can I get a witness that? She, when she, ta she takes her hair down. And when, and, and, and when she takes her hair down, men, we get all excited. Come on, brother, and talk to me. She, she take, she take, she's letting it all hang out. Oh, can y'all can clap with me? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? She lets her hair down. Now, now watch this. Everybody's nose is caught the perfume. And this real fine woman, she had to be fine. You know, she, she had that, this figure eight. She, she had to be fine. And, and she takes her hair down. Now watch this. And starts rubbing it on this man's feet. Oh, y'all, that, that's got to be sensual. Come on, ladies, talk to me. That's y'all, y'all not y'all not up in the house, y'all. Now, 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 wait, now, now, wait a minute. That, that's supposed to be a time where she's rubbing some feet with some oil, with some hair, where the lights are turned down low, and you're in a private situation. Can y'all? I'm trying to help y'all see what I'm talking about, and, and 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 she's rubbing her hair on this man's feet in public. There she was, breaking up a male-dominated country club atmosphere by doing that which was not traditional. That was not traditional. She was bold enough, now watch this, bold enough to break down and challenge some traditions in order to worship Jesus. Move out of the ordinary and move to something brand new, uh, but using the same old gospel. When, when you worship God, let me put it this way. Some folk are afraid to worship God because they know that the Holy Ghost is subject to put them on public display. <laughs> you see, True, genuine worship will challenge you to be on public display. Sometimes you can't sit there, and it doesn't bother you. Other times when the Spirit shows up because you re reflect on how you made it through this week, and it begins to work with you, and it makes you do things that will make you become visible. And somebody will say to you, Oh, you really shouted in church today, and you say, I did? You don't even know what you're doing. It's because God brought you through this week, and you had to rave your, wave your hand and shout about what God did just for you. I can't get nobody to witness in here. But here comes the problem. This generation doesn't want to be highlighted. We don't want to be visible. We want to fade away. We don't want to call attention to ourselves. Don't let nobody look at me. But you can't always do that and worship God. Because if you are praising God, get this good. God is going to cause others to look at you 
it's not you he wants them to see. It's the him in you. Woo. He wants folk to see. He wants them to see how he fixed it just for you. And you will become vulnerable to praising God. God will put you on public display so that folk can see the Jesus in you. And when Jesus gets on the inside of you, and when God has brought you out every now and then, it'll make you pat your feet. Every now and then, it'll make you clap your hands. Every now and then, it'll make you wave your hands. Every now and then, it'll make you do like I like to do. I like to hug myself. I'm talking about when the Spirit is responding to the truth of God. When I was in my church that I was raised in, there were three people. One stayed up in the balcony, and he would start, my, 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 my. And then you had Sister Thomas on the main floor on the left-hand side, and she would retort, oh, yes. And then you had Sister Emmanuel on the other side, and she would holler, wonderful. <laughs> and, 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 and they would get, get to going. They would get to going. They, they, they would sometimes say, He's, she'd say, he say, wonderful. And she said, oh, yes. And he said, my, 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 my. And, and all of a sudden, the whole church would start rocking. They'd be waiting on, my, 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 my. And then somebody would say, oh, yes. And somebody would say, wonderful. One day, my grandmother got all excited. I'd never seen grandmother get excited. And grandmother got up, and she said, yes, yes. I want you to know, sometimes the Spirit of God will move Move on you uh, when nothing else uh, will happen. Then you have folk who think they're too educated to praise God. I didn't been to school. I've been trained. I want folk to know I'm intelligent. But when you worship God, you don't bow down at the altar of intelligence. You bow down at the altar of God. Look, now, now, now get this other one, and, and I'm going to quit. Oh, is it all right if I keep on? Look, look how they attacked Mary. We could have sold the perfume for 300 pieces. We could have fed over 300 people. They bombarded her with criticism. And if you are concerned about people criticizing you, you will never really truly worship God. I think I said a word. Look at the text. Now look at the text. Look at the text. It was not the unsaved. Wait a minute. It was not the unsaved that criticized her. Can I say that again? It was not the folk who had experienced how they had been blessed by God that criticized her, but it was the folk who just knew they were saved. They said, it don't take all of that to worship God. But I promise you, if you ever start worshiping God, they will start criticizing you. But don't worry about them criticizing you. People criticize that which they cannot understand. You, which means they cannot understand true worship. Oh. That's deep, ain't it? Because if a person is carnal, in the flesh, mundane, earthly of this world, who cares what they think or say? 
I want to worship God in spirit and in truth. I don't have to be a polished educator. All I know uh, is that God died for all. All I know uh, is that God caused my car to start when my battery was tore up from the floor up. All I know uh, is I put one tank of gas uh, in my car and I only get 15 miles to the gallon uh, and I go backwards and forward to work uh, and I don't get paid uh, till next week. The text says she was extravagant with the perfume. Mary could have poured out just a little oil. Mary could have poured half of it. Mary could have poured out three-fourths of it. But she didn't do any of the above. Mary poured it out all. She didn't waste any of it. She poured it all out on Jesus' feet. And the reason why she poured all of it out on Jesus' feet uh, is because she wanted to know and to let God know how good he had been to her. And it didn't matter what other folk thought. Didn't matter what other folk laughed at or said all they know. Uh, and all people was concerned uh, about what she did did not matter to her because she was worshiping and praising God just for herself. <laughs> Amazing grace as I close. Back in uh, 1991, uh, I was transferred from Houston to the Grace Temple Church. And uh, we bought a house in Grand Prairie, 4621 Devonshire. And uh, We were trying to make this transition from Houston to Fort Worth and Kareen and Crystal and BJ was, BJ might have been six or four and Crystal was six and Kareen was in junior high. And we'd go over there to Grace Temple for the first couple of times, and Crystal said, Daddy, let's go home. Those folk over there don't love us. We got to go back to Houston. I said the same thing when I got to Houston. Let me go back to Texarkana. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, Pastor Ford had some puppies. And uh, he gave us a Rockwell, that was the first Rockwell I ever had. Name was, we named the dog Sheba. And uh, I decided one day to go out in the backyard and play with the kids and play with Sheba. And I uh, got out there and Started running around trying to keep up with Sheba and keep up with the kids. And all of a sudden, I found myself running, out, getting out of breath. And uh, I uh, couldn't catch my breath. So I fell down. Kids thought I was playing, but I couldn't hardly breathe. And uh, Kareen and Crystal and BJ, along with Sheba, all of them was jumping on top of me. They all oh, they were just having a ball. They they just thought Daddy was playing, but Daddy was in serious trouble. 
And so finally they, they kind of calmed down and I, I couldn't stand up. I crawled to the door and crawled in our little den area and crawled on the couch and said, Adela, come here. I always call my wife when I get in trouble. I can't breathe. He said, lay down. Let me call Dr. Johnson. She put some ice on me, and I'm laying there. I want y'all to know I must have weighed about, I did, I weighed about 285 pounds. That's what I weighed, 285 pounds. And uh, I uh, began to cool down, and Dr. Johnson, Adela finally got Dr. Johnson, and got Dr. Johnson on the phone, and Adela told her what was going on. He said, how you doing? Well, I guess you're doing okay. He said, well, make sure he come to my office tomorrow morning. I went to his office the next day. My blood pressure was sky high. He told me, you better lay down. I laid down. He came back in 45 minutes. He took it again. He said, your blood pressure's still high. He said, you, I'm almost thinking about taking you to the hospital. He said, stay just a little longer. I stayed just a little longer. Then he came back in the room with, I'll never forget it, a horse pill. You know them big, huge pills? This was a two-tone blue pill. Uh, did I ever tell y'all this story before? Two-tone blue pill. I said, what is that? He said, this is a high blood pressure pill. I said, what I got to do with that? He said, you better take it. I said, well, how long do I have to take this? He said, if you want to live, you're going to have to take this thing for the rest of your life. I said, not me. He said, oh, yeah, you. I said, well, how in the world, how can I get off of this? He said, lose some weight. 285 pounds, close to 290. I was wearing a size suit, 52. Some of y'all might have seen me. Suit size. If I got a picture in my office with Kirk Franklin, and y'all can see how big I was. And so I said to myself, self? <laughs> you don't want to be like this no more. And I got up. The next morning, and I'm telling y'all, I was too embarrassed for folk to see me. So I got up early in the morning when it was dark, getting ready to turn the light. And I got up, and I tried to walk to the corner, which was not a good 50 feet, right? I could only walk halfway to the corner. And I was sweat just pouring down. And I turned back around. And I went back inside. I did that for a whole week. I went a little further. Finally, I got to the corner. I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about getting ready to praise God. And I did that for a while. Changed my eating habits. And then I went a little further. And after a while, I, I'm going to go a little further. And after a while, I was able to walk four miles. I get up every morning, I'd walk four miles. Because I was still embarrassed. Adela, I tell you, rain, sleet. But it didn't snow, but rain. It didn't matter. Every morning I'd get up. I'd walk four miles. After a while, I started shuffling my feet. I was too embarrassed for folks to see me. And I could only shuffle my feet for half a block, and I'd walk the rest of the way. 
Make the long story short, after a while, I was able to shuffle my feet for four miles. Weight start coming off. Then after a while, I tried trotting. And I trot maybe half a block, shuffle the rest of the way, trot. Then after a while, I started running. That's why my ankle is hurting me now. I run, and after a while, I got to six miles every day. And since 1991, just look at me. I want to thank God for what he's done just for me. I know what God can do if you try. I know what God can do. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God can fix it, but you got to have the strength. You got to have the power. You got to have the faith to know that he can fix it. If he can fix it, say it. Say it. Because of that, I don't care what people say about James Cox. They call me a Baptist preacher if they want to. I don't give a rat's flip uh, what they call me. Uh, all I know is I'm serving God. Uh, he brought me through. Uh, he set my feet uh, in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, and I've been saying. They talk about faith temple if they want to. But by the grace of God, when people come inside this church, they got to feel a special anointing. They know that this church serves a God that's able, able, able to supply all your needs. And when it's over, And now, I wear 44 regular. For those of you who want to buy me a suit, 44 regular. Oh, bless his holy name. I want you to know that God can fix it for you. But one thing about it, you can't stop. You got to keep on doing it. It's an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing. Pray in the morning. Pray in the noonday. Pray at night. It's an everyday thing. Everyday thing.